Hello, welcome back to History for the HSC. And today we ask the question, how did the Nazis control the German people? And more specifically than that, how they sought to control what they thought, what they believed. And they did that through the actions of this man, Joseph Goebbels, and his Ministry of Public Enlightenment. Now, it has been a little while since our videos here. It has been great, however, to see lots of people picking them up and using them to help learn the content just a little better. Please let us know uh, how we're helping you if we are. And as we move forward into the rest of this uh, topic and into future topics, we are going to be trying to make a conscious effort to try break down some of the syllabus stop points a little bit more and focus on smaller dot points in each video. Hopefully that will mean we can make shorter videos so that uh, we personally can research them and produce them at a quicker pace. I guess only time will tell how we go with that. But for now, let's get started with a deep dive into Nazi censorship and propaganda. So in today's video, we'll think about the campaign of censorship and propaganda undertaken in the Nazi state to win the hearts and minds of the German people. The specific syllabus stop point we'll be looking at is, of course, the various methods used by the Nazi regime to exercise control, including laws, censorship, repression, terror, propaganda, and the cult of personality. Today, of course, we'll be focusing on censorship, propaganda, and the cult of personality. Uh, and we will come back to these other ones later on in future videos. Now, as usual, we're going to break down this topic into a few sections. The first one that we want to consider is the instruments of propaganda and censorship. That is, how did Goebbels and the Ministry of Public Enlightenment go about controlling the media narrative inside of Germany, also outside of Germany, to achieve the level of control that the Nazis desired. We'll then want to look at the two main aspects of this propaganda, that is, the two main goals that it set out to achieve. The first of these is obviously Hitler's cult of personality, although we could add to this the glorification of Germany as a whole, the indoctrination into Nazi ideology. And the second is the use of propaganda to demonize minority groups, groups such as Jews, communists, the disabled, those who would become victims of the regime in order to encourage others in Germany to share in their attacks, to, to share in the, their ideology. Finally, we will consider the flip side of propaganda, that is censorship. If propaganda was about repeating what Goebbels himself called the lie time and time again, Censorship was about ensuring that no alternative message could be heard, that the truth could not be heard. And this made it difficult for Germans to form any alternative opinion to the officially accepted narrative within the Reich. So join us now as we jump in to these instruments of Nazi propaganda. Propaganda in Germany obviously came under the control of Joseph Goebbels and the Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. Now we've already spoken about Goebbels' role in a previous video, so today I want to go a little bit deeper into the actual workings of this significant group within the Nazi government itself. The Ministry of Propaganda was formed on the 14th of March 1933, and from this point onwards it would have the singular goal of censoring information and presenting propaganda both in Germany and abroad that suited the Nazis' ideological purposes. It was a significant group of some 2,000 employees, all bent on distilling and creating propaganda to suit the will of the Fuhrer and to target various groups within the Reich. And it was supported by an impressive budget. Initially set at 14 million Reichmark in 1933, this represents around 22 million Australian dollars in today's money. And it didn't stop there. 
Whilst it would be far outstripped by military spending, Hitler and the party would increase their spending on the Ministry of Propaganda as World War II began to cause hardships on the beleaguered German population. By 1941, the ministry was receiving some 187 million Reichmark a year, or around 291 million Australian dollars in today's money. And within the ministry, there were a whole range of different divisions. Division three, for example, was responsible for broadcasting and for the development of the Volksempfänger, the People's Receiver, a cheap radio built by the Nazis themselves and available for under the average two week salary. Now, unlike other forms of Nazi innovation that were really designed to suggest the good life was possible under the Nazis, the most infamous example of this is probably the KDF car, which was presented as something for people in Nazi Germany to aspire to, but was never actually built. The People's Receiver, however, was built and was built in large numbers. And the text on this poster gives a clear indication as to why the Nazis were willing to go to this effort so that all of Germany could hear Führer's words. The production of the Volksempfänger did more than just promote the idea that the Nazis were responsible for the supposed financial recovery in Germany. It allowed the Reich Ministry to effectively spread their message to more and more people on radios designed not even to pick up foreign frequencies. But Goebbels would go beyond just radios. A second division of the ministry, or the second division of the ministry, was responsible for public rallies, such as those held in Nuremberg in 1935. This was the site of the infamous Nuremberg Laws that stripped Jews of most of the political and civil rights within the state. But the Nazis went further with this rally, turning it into a spectacle that could be broadcast through movie theaters. Acclaimed director Lenny Riefenstahl filmed the rally to create what is called the Triumph of the Will, a film that would epitomize Nazi propaganda films. And beyond this, Nazis even made use of international events, such as the 1936 Berlin Olympics, to spread their message and promote their crooked ideology. With a new stadium designed to seat 100,000 people and the swastika flag on proud display to everyone, athletes gathered from 49 nations to compete in the month of August 1936. Reifenstahl again would be given the task of creating another documentary, this time called Olympia. She's credited here in developing many of now what are considered staples in sports television. The Nazis ensured German Jewish athletes did not compete and worked hard to ensure that their Aryan competitors would come on top in the medal tally. In their mind, this would prove their belief in social Darwinism. And whilst they would accomplish this goal with Germany receiving 89 medals and winning the Olympics, the fact remains that the African-American athlete Jesse Owens won four gold medals himself, becoming the most successful singular athlete at the games and highlighting the stupidity of this racial belief the Nazis held. The ministry seized on the Olympics for their propaganda potential. They would be the first televised games and viewers would see the crowds of Germans saluting Hitler. Beyond this, these games would see the inception of the torch relay that we still see in modern Olympics. And so as we can see from even this short discussion, the Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda was thoughtful and careful in terms of how it tailored its message, how it spread its ideology, and how it took on specific opportunities. We haven't even had the time today to discuss the use of propaganda through the Hitler Youth, through all oaths of loyalty in the classroom, through the rewriting of school curriculum, through the production of newspapers such as Das Druma, through posters, through exhibitions such as the Eternal Jew or the De Degenerate Art Exhibitions, through the production of children's books like The Poisonous Mushroom or Trust No Fox and No Jew. In all of this, Nazi propaganda was carefully formulated and it was targeted to reach 
and to indoctrinate German society with a clear and simple message. Hitler, like all dictators, had a strong and significant cult of personality. This was important to the Nazis and they needed to build it through propaganda within the state. If you think back to our video on Nazi ideology, you'll remember the concept of the Fuhrer principle, that Germany should be led by a single authoritarian leader, and that is Hitler. And whilst this was largely accepted within the party itself, the rest of the nation needed some encouragement to come on board with the main ideals. This was perhaps the main goal of Goebbels' Ministry of Propaganda, to promote the Hitler myth, his cult of personality, to try to convince the German people that Hitler was always right, that he had the best interests of Germany at heart. Basically, everything positive that could have been said about him, regardless of fact or fiction, would be repeated and repeated. Hitler was basically deified through the cult of personality. It can be seen through Hermann Otto Hoyer's 1937 painting, In the Beginning Was the Word, which ties an image of Hitler speaking to words from the Bible, tying Hitler to God as God's messenger with the light of his words shining revelation on all those who would listen. Baron von uh, Schickrack, the Nazi politician and leader of the Hitler Youth, would put it this way. We do not need intellectual leaders who will create new ideas because the superimposing leaders of all desires of the youth is Adolf Hitler. Your name, my Führer, is the happiness of youth. Your name, my Führer, is for us everlasting life. He who serves Adolf Hitler, the Führer, serves Germany, and whoever serves Germany serves God. Hubert Lanzinger's The Standard Bearer picks up on this messianic chosen one of God type image. Hitler portrayed as Germany's Teutonic knight in shining armor. His gaze to the distance speaks of hope for the future of Germany. Now as a work that tried to inspire the German people to see in Hitler, see Hitler in this light, it highlights the ways in which the Nazis attempted to build a cult of personality around the Führer. However, as German historian Michael Katter points out in his work, Culture in Nazi Germany, it demonstrates the ludicrous nature of original German art beyond common definitions of kitsch and the depth of evil that lurked behind it. Now, this particular painting you'll notice has a mark around Hitler's eye when this painting was captured by um, Allied soldiers following the war, it was stabbed with a bayonet by an uh, American soldier. The reality is it remains difficult to know for sure how popular Hitler, Hitler really was and therefore how much his cultural personality had seeped into German culture. Certainly he was popular with his supporters. Photos such as this one were not staged. There were genuine crowds wanting to just get a glimpse of the man. Something like Beatlemania but much, much more vile. Ian Kershaw argues that propaganda was only really effective in Germany as long as the situation there remained good. However, this doesn't really account for all the facts. The fact, for instance, that the Wehrmacht, marked the, the German army, remained loyal. Even at Stalingrad, where a quarter of a million soldiers would be ordered by Hitler to remain, although surrounded and without chance of victory. Richard Evans argues that the Nazi leadership knew even by 1939 that most Germans paid its most loudly and insistently proclaimed ideals little more than lip service. In this, he argues that propaganda was actually not effective in shaping the opinions of the German people. It taught them what they must say, but could never make them actually believe it. Either way, whether Evans or Kershaw is right, or whether, in fact, Nazi propaganda was a lot more effective than perhaps we give it credit, this cultural personality was a key aspect 
of that propaganda. And it had perhaps the largest impact of all other messages the Nazi propaganda attempted to preach. It had the most important impact on the German people and on their Nazification. And it particularly had a massive impact on the youth of the Reich. The Ministry of Propaganda made its second focus the demonizing of minority groups and groups that would become targets of the regime itself. And this included propaganda against external enemies, such as the communists or the allies in World War II. But more significant, at least in our study, was the attempted indoctrination of the German people to create popular support for their attacks on these minority groups in order to reduce any public reaction to what they then attempted to do. This aspect of Nazi propaganda comes straight from their ideology, their concept of social Darwinism. To them, the Untermensch, the subhuman, the Jews, were something less than human, a parasite that needed to be dealt with. And this idea is clearly shown in this propaganda poster from 1942, a poster made just as the attacks on Jews really got underway in a major way. This poster attempts to associate European Jewry with typhus and with lice. And this type of negative association, particularly with vermin, was a common tactic of Nazi anti-Jewish propaganda. Perhaps most infamously, the film The Eternal Jew, released uh, slightly after the exhibition by the same name, shows an image of a plague of rats followed immediately by shots of the Warsaw Ghetto showing Jews out in the streets. The voiceover tells us where rats appear, they bring ruin by destroying mankind's goods and foodstuffs. In this way, they spread disease, plague, leprosy, typhoid, fever, cholera, dysentery, and so on. They are cunning, cowardly, and cruel, and are found mostly in large packs. Among the animals, they represent the most rudiment of an insidious underground destruction, just like the Jews among human beings. This theme of Jews as a, a sort of parasite was a common trope in Nazi thinking. Consider, for example, this quote by Hitler himself. Was there any form of filth or crime without at least one Jew being involved in it? If you cut into such a saw, you find like a maggot in a rotting body often dazzled by the sudden light, a Jew. The reality is The Eternal Jew, this film, didn't find much commercial success in Germany and arguably therefore did not have a huge impact on the people on their way of thinking and was not successful propaganda. However, other films more successful were also released at about the same time, which promoted the same anti-Semitic viewpoint. And perhaps the best known example of this would be Yud Sus, or Sus the Jew. Uh, this historical drama has been described by some as the most anti-Semitic film ever produced. It's basically impossible to get any footage of these days, and that's probably a good thing. However, it was hugely successful in Nazi Germany. Some 20 million people went to see it at the theatre. That's around a quarter of the population at the time. And perhaps this goes to show that the allure of Nazi propaganda was actually far more effective when it was combined with a story that the public may have wanted to see and listen to in the first place. However, it wasn't just Jews that became targets of campaigns of propaganda against them. Germans with physical or mental disabilities could easily become targets of the regime. And perhaps the best known example of this is the Action People program, the Nazi forced euthanasia program of the infirm and the mentally ill. Goebbels and his propaganda ministry attempted to justify this action in the minds of the German people, publishing photographs showing those people who would become victims alongside words that read things like life without hope, life only as a burden, and a moral and religious conception of life demands the prevention of hereditarily ill offspring. However, this is actually an example of Nazi propaganda 
proving ineffective in shaping public opinion. The Nazis would be forced into largely abandoning the Action T4 program, at least forcing it underground, due to public outcry led by opposition such as Cardinal von Gallen. We're going to look at that in a later video, but keep an eye out for it. We've already seen how Nazi propaganda was quite effective in building the cult of personality around Hitler. However, its effectiveness in turning the people against minorities was probably less successful. As Richard Evans argues, it was more effective in sh shifting attitudes, particularly of the young, although not to the extent that the Nazis desired. However, it would never be enough to completely control the public by itself. Coercion would be needed. And more importantly, at least for our current discussion, propaganda can never be fully effective so long as people can see for themselves the lies that it is promoting. And so our final piece of the puzzle, in order to understand the work of Goebbels and the Ministry of Propaganda in terms of indoctrinating the German people, is of course that of censorship. As the American journalist Walter Lippmann put it, without some form of censorship, propaganda in the strict sense of the word is impossible. In order to conduct a propaganda, there must be some barrier between the public and the event. Access to the real environment must be limited before anyone can create a pseudo environment that he thinks wise or desirable. Censorship was essential to Nazi Germany. And to this end, the Ministry of Propaganda had oversight over a second organization called the Reich Chamber of Culture, which was created in September 1933 as part of the effort towards Gleichschaltung, coordination, the Nazification of the state. The Reich Chamber of Culture acted as a professional organization for all artists, all creatives within Germany. They were required to seek membership and to do so would require them to prove their Aryan ancestry. Through this organization, modern works of art found themselves banned, along with destruction and later burning of literature that the Nazis despised. Works such as Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, uh, along with anything considered Jewish, would of course burn, but along with those texts, some that might surprise us somewhat. Authors such as H.G. Wells, Leo Tolstoy, Victor Hugo, Ernest Hemingway, Oscar Wilde, just to name a few, their books also burnt and censored within Germany. Jazz and swing music would also find itself banned in Nazi Germany as being African-American and therefore not suitable to the Aryan race. We'll see in a later video how this ban would lead to the swing youth in Germany as a form of opposition to the Nazi regime itself. And in reality, despite this internal censorship of this music style, the Nazis were willing to use jazz and swing music as a form of propaganda externally, with the Nazi jazz band Charlie and his orchestras, whose music was used to spread Nazi propaganda beyond the shores of Germany itself right throughout the war. Beyond all this, there was, just as in the Soviet Union, a large degree of self-censorship. Most historians believe that the majority of the German population never fully came under the sway of the Nazis, but that fear of reprisal and attack kept them under control, and that propaganda convinced them that they were alone and with no support. The reality is that for anybody wanting to work in the creative fields during this period, they were needed to promote the party ideology, whether or not they agreed with it themselves. To do anything else would invite the same barbarity on themselves. An example, perhaps, could be Lenny Riefenstahl, whom we mentioned earlier. She maintained right up until her death that she was not a Nazi, that she'd been naive, unaware of the realities of the men she served. It's still a contentious matter whether she agreed with them or not. However, she was found innocent on some 40 different trials where she was put, up, um, put on trial. The control of the arts, however, would be of little value to the Nazis if the media itself, the news media itself, remained against them. This, however, was dealt with very quickly during their consolidation of power in 1933 with the publishing 
of the editorial law or the editor's law. In section 14 of that piece of legislation, we read, editors are especially bound to keep out of the newspapers anything which tends to weaken the strength of the German Reich outwardly or inwardly. The common will of the German people, the German defensibility, culture or economy, or offends the religious sentiments of others. In effect, the editor's law gave Nazis full control over the media within the Third Reich. It removed all non-Aryans from positions as journalists and editors and enforced extremely significant levels of oversight in terms of what information could be produced and given to the public. To show this in action, we just need to have a look at what happened. In 1933, when the editor's law was passed, Hitler had just come to power, and there were some 4,700 different newspapers in Germany. The Nazis controlled about 3% of that. By 1944, there were only 1,100 newspapers remaining in print. The Nazis had direct control over around half of them, and the other half having to follow the strict regulations put in place by the editorial law and by the Ministry of Propaganda. Censorship really was this second piece of the puzzle in propaganda in the Nazi state. It allowed Hitler and his supporters to keep a lid on any potential opposition. Where propaganda may have failed to win the hearts and the minds of many in Germany, censorship kept them from questioning too much what they were told. This has been history for the HSC and what was supposed to be a slightly shorter deep dive into censorship and propaganda in the Nazi state. Looking at the timing here, didn't quite accomplish quite as short as we wanted, but it's a little bit shorter. We've seen the instruments that the Nazis use uh, in terms of their propaganda to create a cultural personality around Hitler and to demonize minority and opposition groups. And we've seen the second piece of that puzzle, censorship coming in to ensure only the message that the Nazis wanted promoted was promoted. Please let us know what you think using the comments below. Make use of other videos on the channel. A recommendation video should be appearing on the screen around about now. Remember, of course, you can download this poster, this end screen, using the links in the description below. Next time, we are going to take a look at some of the key laws that enabled the Nazis to maintain their control over the Third Reich in a similar sort of style as we have done today. But until then, guys, keep on studying.